It is a joy and privilege to share with you on this 23rd Sunday after Pentecost. And uh, this is also the second Sunday before Advent. I thank your pastors for this invitation to share God's Word with us this morning. And as a conclusion to the series on Hearing God, I bring you warm greetings from Trinity Theological College as well as from Caris Methodist Church. I'd like to begin with this question. How do we learn about the world from the time we are born? How do we learn about the world from the time we are born? Everything we know about the world, we learn through the, our five senses that God has given us. The sense of sight, hearing, smell, touch, and taste, which makes things very much more bearable. I think, uh, of course, in life, it is helpful to have a sixth sense, which is uh, the sense of humor. And to add to that sixth sense, maybe one, one should also have common sense, which unfortunately is increasingly uncommon for quite uh, a few people these days. While a good majority of us are born with all five senses, there are some who may be differently endowed at birth or may have lost one or more of their senses through accidents. Interestingly, the human body is able to compensate for the loss by sharpening the other remaining senses. For example, people who are blind often have a keener sense of hearing, and they are usually much better at recognizing voices. Similarly, those who are mute seem to have more sensitivity with their sense of touch. The biblical injunction has always been for us to worship the Lord with all that he has endowed us. Worship has always been an all-sensory experience. And we see some of that in the book of Psalms. Offering of sacrifices, raising of hands, blowing of trumpet, tasting and seeing the goodness of the Lord. But perhaps for the modern worshipper, we have somewhat reduced an all-sensory worship experience to only a visual experience. We are hence heavily dependent on the visual word, be it in print or in PowerPoint. In a world that constantly bombards us with images, be it in the advertisement uh, signboards, or the newspapers, or the magazines, or through television screens, or right through our computers as well as our smartphones, have we become so dependent on visual stimulation that we have become desensitized to our other senses, particularly our sense of hearing? Have we conditioned ourselves to be so easily distracted by the visual that we have omitted the other senses, especially the oral. A story is told of a rich old man who had several hearing problems sometime, who had uh, severe hearing problems for some time. And after consulting many doctors, he finally found one who was able to help him. This doctor got him fitted with a set of hearing aids that allowed him to hear better than he had before. And one month later, this rich old man went back to the doctor for a follow-up. The doctor said, your hearing is perfect. Your family must be really pleased that you can hear again. The gentleman said, oh, I have not told my family yet. I just sit around and listen to their conversations. And as such, I've changed my will three times already. So at church, as we now turn to the word of the Lord, let us pause for a word of prayer as we attune our ear to listen to what he has to say to us today. Will you join me as we pray? Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. Take your truth, plant it deep in us, shape and fashion us in your likeness, that indeed the light of Christ might be seen today in our acts of love and our deeds of faith. Speak, O Lord, and fulfill in us all your purposes for your glory. Amen. Church, I have a question for us as, we, as I begin, as I continue my sharing. I hope that you will answer this question personally and as candidly as you are able to. 
Which is more important to you? Your sense of sight or your sense of hearing? Between the two, which is more important to you? Your sense of sight or your sense of hearing? Well, we live in an increasingly pixelated world where we are told that seeing is believing. And as a lecturer at TTC, I have uh, had students who jokingly ask if they could submit four drawings for their 4,000-word final paper, since for them, a picture is worth 1,000 words. This is indeed the MTV generation. This is the generation that relies heavily on social media such as Facebook, TikTok, and Instagram. And I fear that this may be the generation that is so dependent on this invention, which we call the smartphone, such that it makes really dummies out of all of, us, all, all of the users, since we have abdicated the use of our memory to the microchip. As an example, how many of you know the mobile phone of your spouse or your best friend by heart? How many of you remember the birth dates or anniversary dates of your loved ones? Or do you wait for the reminder from your Facebook account before you wish them happy birthday or blessed anniversary? In view of the convenience that this gadget has provided, we have unconsciously abdicated the use of our minds to the microchip. Hence, not surprisingly, we require increasing amount of visual stimulation to get our attention. This is the generation that prefers sermons where the preachers do not speak for more than 20 minutes because this is going beyond the limit of our attention span. Don't worry, I don't think I will go beyond that. This is also the generation that requires a PowerPoint presentation to fill up the brief moments that we begin to lose attention hearing the sermon. And many pastors find it necessary to prepare PowerPoint presentations so that the congregation can follow along. There are a few lecturers at TTC who have not succumbed to the pressure of using visual aids, and they are a rare breed of lecturers who are able to hold the attention of the students by the use of the spoken word rather than visual aids. It seems that this is symptomatic of a generation where we have I would say misplaced our emphasis on what is visual versus what is oral. If there is an audio and visual at the same time, that is probably the best. I must admit that I have at times yielded to this temptation each time I want to use a video or a music clip just so that the congregation will be enthused or perhaps even entertained. Hence, I am conscious of indulging uh, the congregation members by using any visual aids such as PowerPoints. Well, my personal preference is to use PowerPoints only when I teach and seldom when I preach. I remind you of the dictum that is shared uh, by some lecturers. Some PowerPoints have the, po have the points, but no power. Some have power, but no points. And sadly, many have neither the power nor the points. Undoubtedly, we live in a world where the visual more easily grabs hold of our attention than the oral. But if we turn to the Bible, you will notice that there seems to be a preference for hearing over seeing. Let me surface just a few examples for us. Take, for example, Moses' encounter with the Lord in the wilderness. While it is true that Moses saw the burning bush, most of the accounts in Exodus have him conversing with God. We, he saw the manifestation of the power of God, but Moses heard God directly. I may perhaps argue that hearing was more important than seeing here. And in Exodus 32, Moses was to go up to the mountain and receive the law of God. And while he was away for some time, the people grew impatient. They could not see Moses. They could not hear God speaking through him. And so the people demanded to construct a statue of the golden calf. They were clamoring for a divine presence that they can visually see. The Israelites clamored for a God which they could see, a God made out of their own possession, their own perspective, and at their own prerogative, a God 
made in their own image. In chapter 32, we see two contrasting religions. On top of the mountain, God gave his law to Moses. Moses, in turn, was to read it to the people, and the people were to hear it with their ears. It was a religion of the ear. But below the mountain, the people could no longer see Moses, and they were not content with that. They wanted a God which they could see, and it was a God that they would fashion out of the gold that they had. Here we see a religion of the eyes. Another example will be in the call of Samuel. The prophet responded to a divine calling when, we, when he heard God call him four times. In Samuel chapter, uh, 1 Samuel 3, 1, has the interesting phrase, the word from the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were infrequent. And the primary calling of Samuel was then through the hearing and not the seeing. Similarly, for the prophet Elijah, after the most visual demonstration of the power of God in defeating the 450 prophets of Baal, Elijah retreated into hiding for fear of Jezebel's threat. Here was a prophet who had staged a visible battle of the gods. He had witnessed the power of God in a most visible and spectacular way. And yet in his most needful moments, God spoke to him. Yet not in the wind, not in the earthquake, not in the fire. God spoke to him in a still, small voice. In the New Testament, we also see a contrast drawn between the sense of hearing and the sense of sight. A contrast between the religion of the ear and the religion of the eye. As we consider the conversion of Paul, you notice that Saul was blinded by the ray of light and he heard the voice of God, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I make this audacious connection that it was because of the experience of hearing God rather than seeing him that Paul would later write in his letter to the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, For we live by faith, not by sight. Here a contrast is drawn first between faith and sight. Paul would also write in his letter to the Romans in Romans 10, 17, Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. So faith is in direct contrast with sight. The one who walks by faith does not walk by sight. And where, and where does this faith come from? It comes from hearing the message, not just any message, but the message of the word of Christ. Hence, likewise here in the New Testament, we also see the importance of the sense of hearing as opposed to the sense of sight. Since the Enlightenment, we live in a world that keeps hawking the notion that seeing is believing. But for, for us as Christians, it is not so much seeing is believing, but rather believing is seeing. Right? It is not so much seeing is believing, but rather believing is seeing. In this journey of faith, we find that often we have to first believe before we can see. We have to hear and obey before we can see. And this seeing is not seeing as the world does, but seeing with the eyes of faith. In the many examples in the Bible, hearing therefore precedes seeing. There are numerous other examples I can bring up, but I guess you get my point. It seems that hearing is more important than seeing in the Word of God. And this is where Bishop Emeritus Solomon wrote in one of his articles in the Methodist Message in August 2011, and I quote, Both the physical and spiritual ears are important in the exercise of our faith. The other senses may be important in their own ways. But if we have to choose just one of the senses, the Bible's choice always is the sense of hearing, for it represents the religion of the ear." End quote. Another important reason why the Bible emphasizes hearing over seeing 
is that in the Bible, hearing is primarily linked to obedience. In the Bible, we find that often we hear, to hear means to obey. The Hebrew word for hear is Shema. I am not speaking Chinese here, okay? Uh, the Hebrew is Shema. In Deuteronomy 6, 4, 5, we have what is called the Shema, and to this day it is recited by every Orthodox or conservative Jew twice a day. And I think it has been read for us. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. I have chosen for our scripture passage this morning the reading from Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 to 9. The book of Deuteronomy is known as Hadabarim in Hebrew scripture, which means really the words. It refers to the important words that Moses spoke to the people. The English title is derived from, I would say, a, me a Greek mistranslation of the Hebrew phrase, which should rightly be rendered as a copy of the law. In the Hebrew, it renders a copy of the law. And in the Greek, it is translated as the, the second law, which is why we get the English Deuteronomy. The occasion for this review of the law is when the new generation of Israel was preparing to enter the promised land. And this is where Moses reminded and urged this new generation, the ones that were too young to have participated in the first covenant, to re-covenant with the Almighty God. And so the Shema is Israel's basic creed. It is not a prayer, but rather a declaration of faith. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Israel is first called to hear. Second, they must learn that their God, He is the only God. And third, that their response to their God is to be one of love. In the Jewish faith, the Shema is a pledge of allegiance to the one God. Israelites interpreted it literally. It is said that upon rising in the morning and upon going to sleep at night, it is said when praising God and when beseeching uh, God to answer their prayers, it was commanded that this creed should be carried about with them wherever they went in Deuteronomy 6, 8 and written on the entry to their homes. The Shema is written on parchment that is contained in the mezuzah that the Jews affix on the doorposts of their home and in the tefillin, where they bind to their arms and to their head. The Shema is the first thing that a Jewish child is taught to say in Deuteronomy 6-7. And not surprisingly, Mary and Joseph would have taught Jesus this very important creed. Many a sermon has been preached on the text, and most of them would focus on the priority of the creed, the primacy of God who is one, or the practice of familial education in passing down this important teaching. But for today, I only want to help us focus on the significance of the opening imperative, that very first word. And that first word is hear, Shema. In Hebrew, the word Shema means not only to hear, but also to keep. To hear the law is to keep the law. Hearing is hence equated to obedience. In the New Testament, we also find that obedience is emphasized over and over again. The one who claims to be a disciple must show a life of obedience. For example, Jesus says in Luke 8, 21, But he answered and said to them, My mother and my brothers are these who hear the word of God and do it. And in Luke eleven twenty eight, Blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. In his book, The Humiliation of the Word, French philosopher and theologian Jacques Ellul laments the church's increasing spiritual deafness. In its embrace of the other senses, the church faces the danger of deceiving itself with what appears to be entertaining and declining into a pragmatism that misleads it to make assessment by what is seen and measured rather than by what is heard by the inner ears. Another more recent author who critiques the explosion of the image culture is Shane Hips. In his book, Flickering Pixels, Hips wrote, and I quote, 
in a very real way, image culture is eroding and undermining imaginative creativity. Imagination is extremely important to our functioning as healthy, creative people. A weakened imagination means it will be increasingly hard for us to solve the problems that confront us on a daily basis. Our minds become lethargic and passive beneath the torrents of images simply awaiting fresh stimulation." End of quote. In other words, we may become so addicted to visual stimulation so much so that the mind loses its creative ability to think as well as to imagine. In the preface to his book, which I recommend to those of you who are interested to understand how information technology is affecting all of us, Shane Hips perceptively summarizes, and I quote again, every day we are entranced by a mosaic of flickering pixels. All of you who are at home are actually watching the screen, so you are entranced by a mosaic of flickering pixels. These little dots of light are practically invisible, so minuscule that we often ignore them. Nevertheless, they change us. Flickering pixels compose the screens of life, from televisions to cell phones to computers. These screens, regardless of their content, change our brains, alter our lives, and shape our faith all without our permission or knowledge. Right, that is the frightening part. It changes our brains, it alters our lives, it shapes our faith, all without our permission or knowledge. End of quote. In a way, I think we have allowed the excesses of what is in our culture to dictate how we organize church, how we express ourselves in worship, or even how we engage with the living God. Think about this. Will we be able to worship God when the power that supplies electricity for all the projectors and television, the musical instruments and the sound equipment, all that malfunctions? I'm not suggesting that we do away with all technology and return to the ways of the Amish or the Quakers. Neither am I suggesting that we return to primarily using candles and printed sheets for worship. I am aware that given the coronavirus pandemic, the church has been adopting and adapting to the use of technology. And many of us have been glued to the computer or mobile screens for hours, be it over Zoom meetings, YouTube videos, or the more recent uh, November 11 shopping spree. Again, I'm not suggesting that we ban the use of info technology and modern accesses to information which in many cases has become sources of really misinformation. Our problem really is the excesses of excesses. Right? You hear me correctly, the excesses of our excesses, uh, spelled E-X-C-E-S-S, -S, and the second will be A-C-C-E-S-S, -S, when we have excess of our access to mobile technology. That, I think, is one of the biggest problems. And so let it be understood clearly that I'm not suggesting that we go back to the days of uh, coin phones or the era of checking 24 volumes of encyclopedias to get information. Playwright Lim, Lim Haiyan has written a play highlighting this real-life obsession of social media and its impact on the day-to-day -day interaction among people. I do not know if you've seen her, the play before. The title of the play is well captured in the Chinese and you have to hear this carefully. The title of the play is So Ji Ai Ting. All right? So Zu the So, Zu Ai the Ai. So Ji Ai Ting, which literally means fixation on the phone impedes relationship. The phrase is also a homonym for a mobile phone love affair. Have we allowed the mobile phone to impede our relationships? Rather than a total ban against the assault of information technology and modern innovations, my question is, can we learn to wean ourselves off an indulgent dependence on the visual and learn once again to hear God? To wean ourselves off from an indulgent dependence, 
All right, the dependence here is described by the word indulgent. Are we indulgent and being fixated on these visual aids? And are we really listening to God with a clear understanding of where He wants us to go? Can we factor in moments of silence and stillness in our worship so that we can train our congregation members to be still and know that God is still God? So church, is your seeing more important than your hearing? How well can you hear the Lord's voice in our lives today? How well do you obey God's voice? How is your hearing? You may have heard this story before uh, by other preachers, and it is a story that I think I would uh, conclude by sharing this. It is the story of a Native American and his friend who were in downtown New York City for a visit. This Native American and his friend was walking near Times Square in Manhattan. It was noon, uh, lunch hour, and the streets were crowded with people. Cars were honking their horns, taxi cabs were squealing around the corners. There were sirens wailing and sounds of the city was almost deafening. Suddenly, the Native American said to his friend, wait, I hear a cricket. His friend said, what? You must be crazy. You couldn't possibly hear a cricket in all this noise. No, I'm sure of it, the Native American said. I heard a cricket. That's crazy, said the friend. The Native American listened carefully, and for a moment, he then walked across the street to this big cement planter where some shrubs were growing. He looked into the bushes beneath the branches, and sure enough, he located a small cricket. His friend was utterly amazed. That's incredible, he said. You must have superhuman ears. No, the Native American friend said, my ears are no different from yours. It all depends on what you are listening to. But that can't be, said the friend. I could never hear a cricket in all this noise. Sure you could, the Native American said. You hear what you are listening for. Here, let me show you what it means. And with that, he reached into his pocket and pulled out a few coins. And discreetly dropped all those coins on the sidewalk. And then the noise of the crowded street still blaring in their ears, they noticed that every head within 20 feet turned to see where the money was tinkling on the pavement, whether that money was theirs. See what I mean? Asked the Native American. It all depends on what you are listening to. With this little modern par parable, I think I should end here. My brothers and sisters, how is your hearing this morning? How has your hearing been this past year? What or perhaps who have you been listening to? What has God been saying to you about this past year? Remember that the Bible makes no distinction between hearing and obedience. To hear is to obey. Have you obeyed in what you have heard from God? If not, what is holding you back from obeying? At the close of a year and the beginning of a new year, there are some questions worthy for our consideration. For last year, some of us may have heard a lot and done very little. Others of us may have done a lot, but actually heard very little from God. And so may God help us so that we don't have too much or too little of either, but really that we are able to obey Him in all that we hear from Him. And since we stand at the beginning of a new year, and by new year I mean a new liturgical year with the coming of Advent, may I wish you all a happy new year. I hope you heard me correctly. I wish all of you a happy new year. Remember, it really is dependent on who or what you are listening to. Will you join me as we close with a word of prayer? Almighty God, you have spoken to us through your Son. Let your written word now be spoken, be heard by each of us. Give us ears to hear and hearts to understand that we may not refuse your calling or ignore your voice. And as we stand on the threshold of another year dawning, 
Our prayer is that we may indeed learn to hear you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly. In the peerless and precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.